to our fourth Conservation Champions webinar titled Rehabilitating Rescued Wildlife. My name is Vera and I'm your host for the evening. Conservation Champions webinars are organized by Mandai Wildlife Group. And this series of webinars is curated to help you discover more about uh, wildlife conservation through the eyes and hands of our staff and conservation partners. Now this August, uh, as we think about all things Singapore, we also wanted to highlight a very special group of animals. And this, these are the wild animals that are native to Singapore, as well as the migratory species that visit us seasonally as part of, the, of their migratory routes. So these animals form an important part of our nature heritage, and we are privileged to be one of the de designated centers in Singapore for rescued wildlife. And each year we admit over 1,300 rescued animals to our facilities in Singapore Zoo and Jurong Bird Park and help them get back on their feet, bellies or wings, whatever applies. So um, today I am very happy to introduce three of my colleagues who are at the very forefront of rescued wildlife rehabilitation. First up, we've got Dr. Shangzhe, or Dr. Shangs, and he is one of the vets at Mandai Wildlife Group. He's a clinical specialist in avian practice and he also has clinical and research interests in all other species and coordinates scientific and research projects across the group. Uh, we're also happy to have Dr. Charlene Yong, who is also a vet at Mandai Wildlife Group. And besides being part of the team that looks after the health care of animals in our parks, she also oversees rescued native wildlife admissions, treatment and rehabilitation. And last but definitely not least, Si Yun. Um, Siyun is a vet keeper in our Wildlife Healthcare and Research Centre, or Zoo Hospital as we call it. Um, she assists in caring for the hospitalised animals from the parks as well as the rescued wildlife that require treatment and rehab. So, um, this is an overview of our webinar today. And now before I hand over our time to our speakers, uh, let's maybe ease into our topic today with a quick Kahoot quiz called Which is Native? So going back to our uh, webinar now, um, now a lot of you, uh, a bunch of you mentioned, oh, I've not seen any of these animals before. Um, but let me uh, pass the time over to our vets who definitely have. Uh, they have chosen uh, these species to talk about today uh, at our webinar. And um, I think these cases were uh, significant to them and they'd like to share more about their experiences um, in rehabilitating some of these animals who were rescued uh, and brought to our parks. So I'm going to hand over the time to Dr. Charlene. Hi, thanks very much, Vera. And can everyone hear me well? Okay, great, thanks. Well, thanks everyone for joining us this evening. Um, and yep, and welcome to the Conservation Champions webinar. I'm Dr. Charlene, and together with me, uh, Dr. Shangzhe and Si Yun, and together we'll be sharing with you to this evening about uh, the rescued wildlife that we have uh, re rehabilitated here at Bandai. So just a quick snapshot of what we're going through tonight. Um, we'll be talking about Singapore's biodiversity and conservation here, a little bit about rescue, rehabilitation and release, Mandai's role in this process, and also what you can do um, to help with conservation in Singapore. So despite being such a small city state, we are really truly fortunate and privileged to have so much wildlife and nature around us, ranging all the way from mammals, amphibians, birds, reptiles, fish, and all sorts of invertebrates as well. And this has garnered a uh, tremendous uh, um, interests, not just locally, and we certainly have had a number of local documentaries made as well, um, but even international interests, and we even have documentaries that have been narrated by Sir David Attenborough. So this, um, this little slide really is just to showcase a little bit of the biodiversity that we do have here in Singapore. Um, these are some species that can also be found uh, within our parks around Mandai. So as the next time you come to our parks, make sure that you do look out for our native wildlife as well. Um, and some of these species are also species that we have rehabilitated here um, in, in Mandai as well. 
So does anyone know what species that is in the top left-hand picture? Well, that's the Hosfield flying squirrel. And um, this is quite a really special uh, species to us, uh, not a commonly seen wildlife at all. Um, it's a small little squirrel, and you can see in the insert there, it actually has a membrane that stretches between the front legs and the back legs that allows this, um, this animal to glide from tree to tree. Quite an amazing little creature. And this was the, um, the Hosfield flying squirrel that we uh, fostered um, a little while ago. Um, some other species that we have also include the crested goshawk, um, the common uh, greenback frog, the critically endangered straw-headed bubu, a number of reptiles such as this mangrove uh, snake, and in the bottom row, the Wagler's pit viper, the spotted wood owl, the common dog-faced fruit bat, and the uh, common palm civet. So why is there a need for biodiversity conservation in Singapore? Well, apart from the fact that we do have a wide variety of wildlife in Singapore, we are also very highly urbanized. You know, we've got about 5.4 million people um, all fitting into a small little land area. And um, if I'm not wrong, Singapore's about the third most densely populated country and territory in the world. So that's quite a lot of people in a small, in a small space. And yet, despite this, we also have the Singapore Green Plan, in which we create a green, livable and sustainable home for all of us here in Singapore. And within this green plan is the, the move towards a city in nature. We will be immersed in green spaces and other, other natural habitats. And at the same time, our uh, potential for interactions and opportunities for interactions with wildlife will also increase. And another really important reason for the need for biodiversity conservation in Singapore is the concept of One Health. And this is the idea that the human health, environmental health, and animal health are all very closely interlinked and intertwined. Well, we've all just um, recovering now from the pandemic, and I think we're all absolutely aware that our own health is, is really important and closely linked with the health of the people around us as well as the environment and um, animal health as well. And, and when we talk about health, we're not just referring to physical health, we're also referring to mental and emotional health. So what are some of the threats, or some of the major threats that you think are faced by our native wildlife in Singapore? Go ahead and type your responses in the chat box. And we'll have a little chat after that to see if you're right. So we've got some, um, I'm just going to voice over for Dr. Charlene, who can't see, actually see her chat box. Uh, so we've got some replies here. Uh, we've got habitat loss, lack of habitat, habitat loss, deforestation. Um, we've got a lack of understanding towards uh, native wildlife, which can create unpleasant incidents, uh, roadkill, uh, habitat fragmentation, of feeding, irresponsible feeding, pollution, invasive species, uh, predation by stray animals, global warming, and the, um, the fact that we take away animals' homes, poaching, Pedro asks. <laughs> okay, I think we've got enough to go on. Back to you, Dr. Shali. Thanks, Vera, and thanks everyone for also for um, putting your responses in the chat. And actually, you're all, you're all right. So there are quite a number of threats that are faced by native wildlife here in Singapore. And the major threats include habitat loss and alteration, human wildlife conflict, road traffic accidents, invasive species, and yes, to some degree poaching as well. However, there are also quite a number of mitigation measures as well as solutions. And um, so for example, if habitat loss is a threat, habitat preservation and, and, and enhancement is a really important solution. And therefore um, the plan to move towards a city in nature and our Singapore Green Plan serves to, um, serve to exactly address that. Other mitigation measures include things like uh, conflict mitigation, wildlife barriers to reduce or to minimize wildlife coming out onto roads, um, population management, legislation and enforcement, 
rehab, re rehabilitation and release, as well as education and outreach, which is exactly what we're doing here. So for the rest of this webinar, I'd like to focus on rescue, rehabilitation and release. So what exactly is wildlife rehabilitation? It is the temporary provision of care to injured, sick or orphaned wildlife with the ultimate goal of releasing them back to the wild. And there are three main phases of this whole process. The first part, rescue, we do very closely um, in conjunction with our partners like NPARCs and ACRES. And uh, after an animal is rescued, you know, it's assessed and then uh, treated and potentially rehabilitated. And that's where we'll be focusing the rest of our um, webinar today. And for the release phase, excuse me, and for the release phase, we work very closely with our partners as well, like NPARCs, um, to do so. So I'd just like to show you some examples of the rescue situations some animals uh, may, that we may face. And just a word of warning, there are some gory pictures coming up. Um, so just be prepared. So some traps like glue traps um, are in fact very distressing and, um, and, and very uh, stressful for the animals, uh, whether they are wildlife or otherwise, um, that are caught in these traps. Uh, they can be very painful, distressing, and, um, and very stressful. Some other situations in which um, some other uh, animals may be rescued or found include things like road traffic accidents. Um, and and, uh, and, and trauma with urban environments. So this, uh, this common dog-based fruit bat um, came into contact this, uh, with some kind of very hard surface, for example, a window or, uh, or a fan. And you can see that the left wing is broken. And this young common palm civet was actually um, unintentionally trapped uh, in a rat trap. And unfortunately, the, um, the hook that was used to bait the trap got caught in the civet's jaw. And when the, civet, the, when the civet came to us, it actually had um, a very uh, completely broken jaw. This other common palm civet uh, was, was also um, sustained its injuries in a trap. Unfortunately, common palm civets are one of those species that are very sensitive and are very stressy. And so when they are caught in an area in which they feel uncomfortable, they will often try to, to escape and get out of. So when this is a trap, um, sometimes they may actually cause abrasions around their face, even um, break their, their claws, and sometimes even hurt their teeth and the gums. And so, and so, for example, in situations where common palm civets are found or you know, make the noise on, on the roof as they as they walk along. And um, just the act of, of uh, of catching and tr translocating them isn't completely benign. And sometimes, um, you know, these consequences can actually, or rather these actions can have unintended consequences, for example, trap-related injuries. And in the bottom right-hand picture, this, this reticulated python um, unfortunately had been hurt by some people and uh, resulting in very severe uh, skin tears, as well as other injuries um, that are not in this picture. However, when, when there are other um, situations where the animals can be treated and rehabilitated, then we will certainly proceed to do so. The, um, the rehabilitation process are actually uh, three stages, and I will actually hand over to Si Yun um, to talk about the three stages of rehabilitation. Over to you, Si Yun. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much, Dr. Charlene. So, uh... I will proceed on to walk all of you through uh, with the three stages of the rehab process that we have in Mandai. So um, first of all, I'll just be telling you that uh, I'll be sharing with you all uh, some examples of the Sunda pangolins that have undergone uh, treatment and rehab under our care. So in stage one, uh, we're looking at the intensive care. So you can see from the photo. So these are uh, examples of such cases are uh, when uh, young animals comes in and it requires fostering and possibly for bottle feeding as well. So another example that, um, that we come across as well is when uh, animals arrive with severe wounds. Like in this, uh, in this, in this case, uh, this pangolin had su uh, sustained severe wounds on the back and tail and requires daily wound treatment. So in addition to treatment, we also take in consideration that uh, mental, stimulation, sorry, uh, mental stimulation is important and still uh, is required by the animal during, our stay, uh, during their stay here. 
So hence, uh, as you can see from the, the short video, uh, we are using a type of uh, puzzle feeders uh, during the food uh, presentation, uh, during the feeding times. So this is a very natural uh, foraging behavior that is displayed by the pangolin, which is to dig out the ants' eggs. Uh, so what we're doing here is to encourage the mental stimulation, whereby the animal has to work, of his, uh, work for his food while keeping the wounds still clean at the same time. Now, uh, moving on to stage two, which is the intermediate stage. So following up on the same individual that you just saw with the severe tail and back wounds. So in this stage, uh, the wounds are healing well, but still requires uh, daily treatment. So it is very important that we still continue to ensure the wounds remain clean as part of the treatment process. So during his recovery journey here, we had noticed that the pangolin is getting a little chubby and requires more exercise. So we're just encouraging it to follow the, the skateboard with the food on it. Yeah. So thankfully for us, uh, this individual is uh, reasonably food motivated and that allows us to devise this, this particular special way to, for him to exercise while, um, like I said, the, the priority, which is to keep his wounds clean. So moving on to the last stage, which, which is the pre-release stage. So this is a very uh, crucial stage. So we are looking at the preparations for release back to the wild for the, for the wildlife. So we in this um, priority, uh, we have to ensure to be certain that the wildlife is fit enough, had gained and displayed sufficient appropriate behaviors to thrive in the wild. So the housing environment is set up to be as natural as possible to encourage high activity level in a complex environment. So such uh, housing environments also provide opportunities to display natural behaviors, such as what you're going to be, uh, be seeing now, um, which is this little pangolin foraging for um, the natural food in the wild that's provided. So now I will hand over uh, to Dr. Shangsha to sh share more with you. Uh Oriental honey buzzards are one of the most common migrant raptors in Singapore, so I can understand why some of you thought it was a native bird uh, in the previous quiz. And I can see a lot of the answers that uh, match what we have here. The honey buzzard eats mostly larvae and honey of bees and wasps, but also lizards, frogs and other insects when they are available. So in this particular case, uh, a few months ago, we were presented with an oriental honey buzzard with fracture of the left wing. And more specifically, it's the left humerus that was fractured. And that's the big bone, uh, the equivalent of your left arm. And in the x-ray on the screen, you can see the arrows pointing to the two pieces it was broken into and a big metal pin, that's the bright white line running through the middle uh, that we put in to hold it together. And we did this surgery on the same day that it came in to us. We don't always do this. Sometimes the patients have other more life-threatening injuries that we need to stabilize before putting it through surgery. But this patient um, only had that one injury, so we were able to do it uh, quite successfully uh, on the first day. Now, that's usually the easy part. So the vets you know, spend maybe one or two hours on the surgery, getting the bones aligned. But um, the magic and the hard work comes after that because a lot of times you can put the bone together, but the patients uh, need to be able to survive um, and thrive under our care before it can be released. And in the case of the oriental honey buzzard, its diet is very specific and quite difficult to replicate uh, under our care. Like we can't go out and catch bees every day for it or get a beehive without endangering ourselves. So we talked to our nutritionists, we talked to a few other experts, and we came up with a formula consisting of 70% insects. And we had mealworms, crickets, cockroaches, ant eggs, and the other 30% was made out of egg yolk and chicken meat. And we had the patient in quite a small space for the first three weeks while the bone healed. And then three weeks after surgery, we put the pin, literally, I mean, not. We didn't give up on the patient. We just removed that pin that we put in because the bone had healed enough by then. And then we moved it to a larger outdoor aviary for rehabilitation. And you can see in that video, it's a very small space, uh, enough for the patient to stretch his wings, get some sunlight, 
but not enough to you know fly around and damage the bone that is still healing. And um, another three weeks from then, so six weeks post surgery now, we started active rehabilitation. And that video on the right is the first day of our attempt at this. And you can see it's just walking around, not even trying to flap its wings. And that, that's a time lapse. They don't usually move that quickly. And you can see we're taking it very slowly, not forcing it to do anything it doesn't want to do. Uh, and for another two weeks, we were trying that and it's taking its time to start to use its wings more. And we then moved it to an even larger aviary than the first one. And you can see in that picture there in such a large space, we can deck it out with the right perches, the right foliage to encourage it to fly around on its own so that we still do the active rehabilitation, but then it's also doing its work uh, when we are not making it fly. And there's a video uh, of this. This is another three weeks in that big aviary. And you can see it's flying from one end to the other. Not very clear, but yes, it's starting to do a lot of that inside that space. In the meantime, we're still doing the active rehabilitation. And this video will demonstrate how much progress is made from that first day where it was just walking around. You can see it can fly from that buggy to um, one of the low branches on the tree quite well. And 15 weeks post-surgery, you upgraded um, to the arena where we hold our Kings of the Sky show. So it was using that area when we were not having the show. You can see how well it's flying now. And in that two seconds that was blocked by our nurse's back, you can see it was actually trying to fly more, but it couldn't because it had a string tied to its feet. So we borrowed this technique from um, ancient falconry. It's not something that you should be doing at home, but it allows us to allow the bird to fly without it escaping or going back into the wild before it's ready. So by this stage, we're very happy with its progress. We gave it another week and uh, we finally decided that the time has come and that it can go back into the wild. And this is a video to demonstrate the process on the day. So you can see we repeated its x-rays to make sure that the bone has healed well. And you can see there's a perfect x-ray there. We gave it a full body check, including a blood test, make sure all its feathers were perfect. And we put a tracker on it so we can be sure that it's uh, thriving in the world. And then it's a simple thing, just open the cage. Took a while to decide where it wanted to go. And once it did, it never looked back. So as you can see, it's uh, 10 full weeks of active rehabilitation. So that's a lot of work that we put in, but it's uh, worth every second of it. All right, thank you. And uh, Dr. Charlene will tell you a bit more about the other cases. Thanks, Dr. Shangzhe. All right, so I'd like to now share with you about uh, Sundar, Sundar Kalugos. And I have to admit that this is actually one of my absolute favorite species. Um, so Sundar Kalugos are also native to Singapore. And I've got a little quiz for you. When are Kalugos usually active? Go ahead and type your responses in the chat. So do you think that they are active during the day, so they're diurnal, or are they uh, nocturnal, meaning that they're active at night, or are they crepuscular, so active more at dawn and dusk? Okay, uh, so again, I'll, I'm going to voice over the uh, replies for Dr. Charlene. So everybody has said either nocturnal, oh no, 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 no. Okay, so there's mostly nocturnal, there's one morning. Pedro says, when it's cool, you go. <laughs> um, yeah. So mostly nocturnal. One person says morning. And Pedro has a special answer. Mika says, so cute. I agree. Great, thanks. Thanks so much for participating, everyone. Well, uh, most of you are right. So they are nocturnal, meaning they're active uh, at night. Um, and they're also completely arboreal. So this means that they are actually, they actually live completely in the trees. And they are a volant uh, mammal, meaning that they're a mammal that can glide, um, that have the ability to glide. And so this is one of the ways that they actually move from tree to tree, quite an amazing um, little creature. 
The, the diet is also very specialized. So they are actually um, folivorous, meaning that they eat uh, mainly leaves. And um, they're also a very sensitive species and they don't do well outside of the, well, of the wild. And what this means is that it actually makes it quite tricky and quite difficult for us when, when sundakologos come to us and require treatment and hospitalization. And this is actually um, what happened with this particular Kologo. So she was found stranded on the ground. Uh, we can see in an urban environment and she wasn't able to, to escape um, to the natural environment. And when she was brought to us, we examined her. And we found that she had this condition called myopathy. And what essentially what this means is that um, she had a muscle breakdown. And I'm not sure if any of you remember this particular case that was reported in the news a little while ago. Um, two ladies uh, suffered from muscle breakdown after an exercise class and actually had to be hospitalized. Well, this was essentially what happened with the Kologo too. So she also suffered from myopathy and it's a potentially fatal condition. However, in addition to the myopathy, we also found that she was in a thin body condition um, and she also had an abdominal puncture wound uh, and a dermatitis. You can see in the top right hand picture there, the skin around her, her leg and her abdomen were actually not very healthy and we're not sure how she got that. But very worryingly, she also had blunt nails. So you can see those are her nails in the bottom right hand picture you can see there on the screen. So if you remember, colugals are completely arboreal and they can glide from tree to tree. And what this means is that they absolutely need very sharp, curved and long claws, like you can see in the left-hand picture, um, and for them to be able to move and, uh, and to stay up in the trees. However, this particular colugals had very, very blunt nails and she wasn't able to climb up and get away. And unfortunately, this actually would, essentially means a death sentence for this Kologo. And if you recall, Kologos are also a very sensitive species and they don't do well outside of the wild. So we needed to hospitalize this, this Kologo to be able to treat her effectively and give her nails the chance to grow out so that we could then, um, we could then treat her nails as well. So through trial and error and a combination of medical and environmental management, we actually managed to find a way to ward this Kologo successfully. And we have actually also used this particular method for subsequent Kologos also. And I will now hand over back to Siyun to share with you about how we managed to, um, how we managed the environment of this Kologo when she was hospitalized with us. Siyun, over to you. Thank you, Dr. Shaleen. So hi, everybody, um, back again. So as mentioned by Dr. Shaleen earlier, um, we have gone through a lot of previous uh, other trial and errors, uh, opportunities and experience. So, and from there, we have developed uh, certain crucial housing requirements that um, will aid in the recovery of this animal during the stay here. So um, colugos are really sensitive, as mentioned earlier again, and uh, hence it is very important for us to minimize any noise uh, disturbance to the animal during the, the process here. So um, the recovery enclosure is placed in the quietest uh, area in the ward, away from heavy human traffic. So natural structures are provided as much as possible. So in the top photo, as you can see, the colugo is resting on a branch. And then apart from serving as a suitable platform for the animal to rest on, the colugo can also cling on it and hide behind it. So from past uh, research and personal observations, we have a reasonable idea what colugos can feed on and their primary diet is. So each colugo um, has its own preference and therefore providing a, a variety is really crucial for, for them and essential. So um, in other words, so basically, just like, like us, any one of us, we have our own preference towards certain type of food and whatnot. So um, this colo if one colugo likes a certain type of leaves, it uh, doesn't mean that the other colugo will like the, uh, take it as a favorite type of leaves. And um, day one, they can prefer one particular leaf, and day two, they can prefer another type. So therefore, um, the variety is really, really essential. So the fresh leaves uh, are harvested daily and provided uh, twice a day. And then in addition to all this primary uh, natural diet, we also um, have trialed a feeding supplemental commercial diet for herbivores, that's meant for herbivores, to meet the daily uh, energy requirements and to maintain her weight. 
Yes, so uh, now I will hand over back to Dr. Shelley to talk more about the new technique to reshape the Kolugo nails. Thanks, Yun. It definitely took a lot of effort um, for all of us to get this Kolugo successfully hospitalized. And while she was with us, um, she actually then managed to then grow out her, her very short nails. And after almost two weeks, we were actually we actually also developed a new technique to reshape her nails, and then um, enable her to be uh, to be released. And so, and here in this video in the top right hand side, you can actually see essentially we are reshaping the nails so that they create so that they we can recreate the hook um, onto the the blunt end. And so the in the two pictures on the bottom. The left-hand picture is her nail before we reshaped. And in the right-hand side, that's the picture taken after her nails were successfully reshaped. And you can see that they are nice and hooked and sharp again. And I'd like, and I am very happy to report that this uh, Kologo was successfully released and um, she climbed away without even a glance backwards. So this was a real milestone for us, and, uh, and we were all um, very, very happy that we had this successful outcome. So I think you can appreciate that the, the rescue, rehabilitation, and release process is indeed very complex and, and, and multifactorial. So how do, we really, how do we reduce the need for rescues in the first place? And um, well, one way, as we mentioned at the start of the, of the presentation, was to have uh, uh, legislation and enforcement. And while our new Wildlife Act took effect in 2020, and um, this actually allowed our wildlife to be better protected and better conserved to enable us to maintain a healthy ecosystem and actually also to safeguard public safety. At the same time, it's also really important for everyone to understand and to, to recognize that we all have a part to play and, um, and especially also in conflict mitigation because ultimately we're um, learning how to behave around wildlife and about coexistence with wildlife is about keeping animals and people safe as well. So what can you do? If you do see injured wildlife or wildlife at risk of being injured, do call MPAX or ACUS. The numbers are on the screen now and they're both are 24 hour hotlines. Um, MPAX and ACUS are uh, agencies that we work with very, very closely and um, they do most of the rescues here in Singapore. Something else that you can do is also to be mindful when visiting our nature areas or even our parks and gardens. Um, as we move towards the city in nature, uh, our, our, uh, there'll be more and more opportunities for us to interact with wildlife. However, it is really important that we don't feed wildlife, and this includes both intentional and unintentional feeding. We don't want wildlife to associate people with food, and, uh, and certainly we don't want wildlife to approach people for food either. And on that note, it's really also important that we admire and observe wildlife from a distance. So keeping a safe distance ensures that, um, that one, um, that we are uh, a safe distance away from the animal and the animal does not feel threatened. And thirdly, it's also to drive mindfully. And in this way, we're hoping to be able to reduce the number of road kills or road traffic accidents. And what this means is that we need to slow down scan for wildlife both on the roads and adjacent to the roads, and be ready to react appropriately. And in this way, we can make our roads safer, not just for wildlife, but people too. And something else that you can also do is to practice and to promote coexistence with our native wildlife. The Our Wild Neighbors Initiative was launched just earlier this year, so fresh out of the box. And um, it's really the first time that many multiple members of the nature community have come together. Um, and essentially we want to speak with the same common voice in which we, in which we talk about uh, coexistence and being able to live next to our wild neighbors. Knowing how to behave appropriately around our wildlife is also really important. 
So this initiative is centered around a website. You can see the, uh, the, the address on the screen. And it features the 10 most common uh, conflict species and how we can behave around them. And my own personal drive for this particular initiative is seeing the animals that suffer from conflict situations, whether they, are, um, they suffer from road traffic accidents or even civets with trap-induced injuries or pythons or monitors that have been hurt by people. But also seeing people injured by wildlife because ultimately, Human wildlife coexistence is about keeping people and animals safe. We don't have to be best friends with our neighbors, but we have to be able to live next to one another. So in conclusion, Singapore is rich in biodiversity. Rescue, rehab and release play a very important tool in biodiversity conservation, and everyone can play a part. If you do spot injured wildlife or wildlife at risk of injury, do call MPARCS or ACUS. Be mindful of wildlife when you visit nature areas or even around our parks and gardens and practice and promote coexistence with our native wildlife. Thank you. Thank, thanks, Dr. Charlene. Thank you, Dr. Shanks. And thank you, Si Yin. Um, now, I, for one, I, I'm always uh, inspired and or by the amount of passion and um, effort it takes to rehabilitate these um, precious wildlife that we have in Singapore. Um, now, I'm sure uh, I'm sure more of you have some questions to ask. Uh, so, if you have any more, uh, do put them in the chat. Um, I think we've got some that came through uh, the registration, and we are going to. Um, tackle those first, um, as well as the ones that have already appeared in the chat. Yes, okay. So, uh, okay, so tackling the questions that came in earlier during our registration phase, uh, we've got um, this question here, uh, is the number of rescued animals on the rise? Uh, what are the problems leading to this and what is the team trying uh, what what are the problems leading to this that the team is trying to solve um, so I'm going to direct this question to Dr. Charlene Dr. Charlene please thanks very much uh, for the question um, well so there are an increasing number of rescued animals as well as uh, feedback provided by members of the public you know in terms of you know um, wildlife interactions and incidences. And, and they are definitely on the rise. Um, and this could be actually due to a number of reasons. One could be that we are actually seeing more rescued uh, or rather more wildlife coming out into our urban areas or are being found in our urban areas. But at the same time, I think it's also to do with more and more people are becoming aware and um, of all, not just of our native wildlife, but even of who to contact uh, in these particular situations. And so uh, while, while the numbers are rising, it may not necessarily be a direct result of that there are more animals being in trouble. Um, however, having said that, um, as we've uh, mentioned earlier in the webinar, that is really important to mitigate you know, the threats, the, especially the urban threats faced by our, our native wildlife here in Singapore. And one of the, uh, and as you mentioned, there are multiple ways that, that we are doing this, not just, um, not just by Mandai, but also from all our partners in the nature community, including MPARCs uh, and, and other, other organizations as well. And one, of the, um, and one of the ways of mitigating this really is education and outreach. And so just as we are here and uh, all of you are joining us here on this um, Tuesday evening, you know, sharing our experiences and sharing our knowledge, um, is really um, an important way to be able to uh, to help with our uh, biodiversity conservation here in Singapore. Thanks for that, Dr. Charlene. Um, I mean, I definitely think that uh, education advocacy is uh, a very important part of protecting uh, our native wildlife. Uh, so it's and and it's not just you know um, it, it doesn't have to always be from organizations or from the government it can also be from you right uh, so you could also talk to your friends your family about native wildlife and what to do so i think uh, everyone uh, really has a part to play and everyone can protect wildlife as well okay 
So uh, I'll move on to the next question. Um, uh, I think that's, this, is a, this is a good one and also uh, one that Howard asked in the chat earlier, um, which is quite similar. How do you determine if rescued animals are suitable for release and uh, which ones should be cared for long term in Mandai? Uh, and also somebody else um, asked, where can I see these animals that Mandai cares for long term? Uh, so I am going to get Dr. Shanks to take this question. Yes, hi. Is my microphone okay now? Yeah. Good. Uh, so yeah, the rescue animals do need to fulfill quite a long list of criteria before we determine that they're suitable for release. Uh, they are quite simple things like that. They need to be able to eat on their own. They need to be able to find food. They need to have enough stamina to travel the distances required uh, for survival in the wild. And uh, we assess this at each stage of their recovery to make sure they are still on the right track. And in general, we try to get them to the stage of release. And very few of them uh, end up being in long-term care with us because we are quite successful with getting them for release, getting them ready for release. And in terms of where you can see them in Mandai, um, they're actually spread throughout the exhibit. So if you go around um, and you see some of the native species in there, uh, and talk to the keepers, there's most likely a story behind some of them uh, in our camp. Thanks, Dr. Shanks. Um, I think so. So maybe just to add on to that, uh, I think some of our pangolins in Night Safari, uh, some of the civets uh, also in Night Safari are, also, uh, are, are um, rescued animals. Uh, that we are caring for long term. So do visit those uh, animals if you are in Night Safari next. All right. Um, so moving on to question number three, what is the rate of rehabilitating these uh, native animals back to the wild? What is our success rate? Uh, and I will uh, get Dr. Shang also to take this question, please. Yeah, we do track these numbers quite closely to know how we're doing. Uh and we do break them down into species as well. So in general, across all species, we have a release success rate of 61%. And this goes up to about 91% for species such as pythons, because those tend to come in uh, healthy without too many problems. Whereas for uh, birds in general, it can be as low as 25%. And that's not because we're not good at treating them. It's because for birds, we concentrate on the type of injuries that other hospitals cannot uh, fix. So in general, the fractures tend to come to us. And as I mentioned before, in the honey buzzards case, some of these uh, birds with fractures also have other life-threatening injuries that cannot be reversed. And a lot of times they do not get to the stage where they are stable enough for surgery. So those uh, you know, don't make it back into the wild. All right, thank you for that. Um, now we will move on to question number four, which is uh, from two seven-year-olds, Mika and Noah. Um, so they ask, why do we keep destroying animals' homes? And do animals have enough place to sleep? Are there enough, is there enough food for wild animals in Singapore? Um, that's, uh, I, I, think, I think children always, uh, get to the heart of the matter. So, <laughs> uh, I, I'm going to direct this question to Dr. Shali. Thanks. That is, that is truly the million dollar question. And uh, I, to be honest, I'm not sure how well I can answer this, uh, Mika and Noah, but I'll try my best. Um, so we, um, we, we do have to try to strike a balance between being able to keep our natural habitats uh, intact, as well as progression with you know, development, urbanization, and having homes and facilities for people as well. And so um, actually, uh, our native habitats here are actually uh, in reasonable condition. Um, but on top of that, we also have this, you know, the Singapore Green Plan and also the, um, uh, the drive to plant more trees as well as to protect and enhance our native habitats. 
And so, so all these um, uh, measures are actually really important in helping to ensure that we keep our wildlife uh, wild and ensuring that they have the natural habitats as well. So um, if we continue to do so, there is definitely enough space and food um, for them to, to sleep and, and to find homes. Thanks, Dr. Charlene. That was a really great answer uh, to a very difficult question. <laughs> um, okay, thanks Mika and Noah as well for the question. Uh, okay, so we've got our next question is um, one that, that came through the chat earlier. Uh, how much resources are dedicated to rehab um, these animals? They sound very high maintenance. Um, and Dr. Shangs, I think, would be a good person to answer that. Yeah, um, the main resource that we have to dedicate to the rehab um, of these animals is time. And on average, uh, you know, each of those cases that we presented today would take up one to two hours uh, of our time, whether it's the vet, the nurses, or the keepers, uh, to do the active rehabilitation. And then there's probably another one to two hours in the um, cleaning, preparation of food, and um, just you know making sure the animals are comfortable when they're not going through the active rehabilitation. So it could take up, uh, you know, almost half the day of uh, each keeper or nurse, and it is high maintenance, but it's something we are committed to doing, and it's something that is very satisfying. And there's no, you know, better feeling than seeing a bird that came in with a wing that's floppy, not able to be used, and you know, about three or four months later, just fly away back into the wild. So yeah, it's something we like doing, and we we'll continue doing. All right, thanks, Dr. Shanks. Um, I think uh, our next question um, can actually be for every one of our speakers. Um, what do you feel is the most misunderstood native species in Singapore? So uh, we'll get Dr. Charlene to start first, uh, and then and then we go around. Sure, thanks. Um, I, I actually think that reptiles are all uh, very misunderstood uh, in Singapore and, and actually beyond. So, you know, reptiles form a very important part of our uh, ecosystem and they help to keep, you know, the whole ecosystem um, in balance. Um, however, people seem to fear reptiles a lot. And, um, and, and, in, and through that fear, sometimes they can actually hurt uh, reptiles. And so I, uh, I think it's it's okay to uh, to be a little bit afraid of of uh, of, of wildlife, um, but it doesn't mean that you you should be you should harm them. And as long as you maintain a safe distance, you know, between yourself and the animal, um, that will result in uh, in not negative uh, interactions. And perhaps uh, someone else will be able to contribute to this question. So for myself, um, I would like to add on to Dr. Shalin because I totally agree with her about the reptiles. Um, but more specifically for me, um, from what I've seen and experienced myself, it's um, especially reticulated pythons because they can get so big. And everybody that I have encountered, as ex excluding colleagues, because my colleagues all love reptiles and um, they, they admire snakes. They, they really like reptiles in general. But the ones that are not... Um, exactly um, have much interaction with animals, specifically uh, reptiles or even snakes, they find reticulated pythons really, really scary. Um, they think that snakes are um, slimy and when you we touch them, they, they attack you for, for no reason and, and whatnot. And I think that that's why I, I kind of feel like they're most understood. And, and you can find reptiles anywhere, you can find snakes anywhere. And it's just not, um, it's, I think it's just a fear that it can be overcome if you understand this um this species and uh, um better yeah and just, you know it's, it's what Dr. Shani has also mentioned before which is just give the animal their space and as long as you don't intrude their space and they will give you that same respect back as well that um that mutual understanding of each other's boundaries yeah 
Yeah, um, so I feel obligated to choose a bird species. And uh, it's the Asian coel that I think is the most misunderstood one. Uh, I know some people don't like being woken up by then, but you know, it's, they are here, they are native species. And it's, you know, when you travel, for example, to Australia, you get woken up by cockatoos. So if you get woken up by a coel, you know you're in Singapore. <gasps> Thanks everyone <laughs> for sharing <laughs> your, um, your opinions. Um, now, uh, I think we've got another question that just came in. Uh, so we will take that one. Um, the question is, do you choose what animals to be accepted by, uh, to be accepted for rehabilitation or do you accept all animals? And Dr. Shang, do you want to take this? Yeah, so we do not accept all animals. We try to concentrate on the native species. And as I mentioned for birds in particular, we also try to take the cases that the other hospitals uh, cannot handle because there are two other hospitals out there, uh, one at M Parks and one at Acres. And they are relatively well equipped and they can deal with most cases out there. So we try to concentrate on the ones that require further care. All right, thanks Dr. Shang. Um, so we've, uh, we've come to the end of the questions that are in so far. Uh, does anybody else have a question? Uh, do put that in the chat now. Um, okay, I think uh, we have exhausted all our questions. Uh, we ah, okay. Uh, we've got a question from Radiance. Um, are there any volunteering opportunities for the public if they are interested? Um, we do have volunteering programs uh, on our, uh, but they are not uh, necessarily uh, vet volunteering programs. Uh, we do have volunteering programs if you would like to speak to people about um, uh, uh, animals in our parks. Uh, we've got um, our Dosen programs or we've got uh, kind of ad hoc opportunities as well. So. Um, my colleague will drop uh, a link to uh, our volunteer site uh, in a little bit and then you can explore as well. Okay. There are a couple of questions that have just come in. Um, can we share a little more on the Himalayan griffin voucher that was rescued, the recent one? Dr. Shanks? Yeah, so that was the Cinerus voucher I think you're referring to. It did come with a group of Himalayan griffin vouchers. So the Himalayan griffin vouchers are the white ones. The Cinerus voucher is the black one. And uh, the Cinerus voucher is not supposed to be this far south uh, along the migratory route. They usually stop at around you know Phuket in Thailand and not any further. Uh, I think uh, personally that it just followed the wrong route. It followed the Himalayan griffin vouchers that do go this far south and then it ended up here. They left and you know it was just left alone. And when we checked him out, he wasn't actually injured. He was just tired. There wasn't even myopathy. You know, the blood test came back perfectly normal. And all it took was three days of rest before you know we saw that it was strong enough to fly. Now the rescue attempts uh, took a bit longer. We actually tried to flight test it a few times in that big field. Uh, and when we were pretty confident that it could fly, that's when we brought it to a you know higher place, a windier place, and that time it managed to fly away. Yeah. Thanks, Dr. Shanks. Um, we've got another question from Joy. Have there any been any amphibian species that needed rehabilitation? And if so, what was the process like? Um, Dr. Charlene can take this one. 
Thanks. Um, we actually haven't had many amphibians come in um, as rescues. Um, and so, well, uh, I, although in the last year and year and a half, I think we've had maybe two, two amphibian patients uh, that were came in from the wild. And actually those two were reportedly weak. Um, and, if, and I'm not sure what happened. Perhaps they were in just in the wrong environment for a little bit too long. Um, essentially, what we, we gave them uh, supportive treatment. So place them in a nice uh, quiet area, uh, make sure that they uh, stayed rehydrated uh, and moist. Um, and then just gave them time to uh, essentially to recuperate. Um, and, and they were actually uh, then successfully released uh, quite soon after they, uh, they came to us. Very cool. I was wondering about that as well. I've never heard, I've never heard of uh, any amphibian species that we've rehabilitated. So thanks for sharing that. Um, okay, I think we've come to the end of our questions and also come to the end of our webinar. Thank you so much, everyone, for participating so actively. Um, and also thank you for this, to the speakers today uh, for sharing their knowledge and their experiences so generously as well.